Um, I'm still waiting for Gino, but I think uh, let's wait a few seconds and then we can kick off. All right, I'll give this maybe one more minute, given that we have a lot to cover. I will, um, I will just give it another 30 seconds and we can get started and people can join as they join. All right, um, let's get started. I think we are one minute past the hour and uh, we, can, we can kick off this webinar. So the first of all, hello and welcome to the, the fifth edition of the Performance Matters series from GameBench. I am Sri Aya and I'm the co-founder of GameBench and I'm really, really excited to have you all on the panel today. And this is um, it's definitely a topic that I think we've all been a bit close to in, in, the, in the most uh, recent year, uh, 20, the COVID year, where I think we've somehow found a way to be on gaming platforms as much as we could. Um, and as a result, we've seen a lot of ISPs and operators um, target their marketing campaigns at, at gamers. And we want to find out what's the trend here and how effective it's been. And we'd love to hear from the experts today. Before I get started, I'd love to introduce the, the panelists we have today. We have uh, Matthew Wallace from at and We have Gunjan Garg from Vodafone. We have Chris Williamson from TELUS. We have Johnny Robinson from Zyber in the UK. And we have Sean Simmons from um, NVIDIA. And on that note, I would like to quickly jump in and set some context here so that we, we all know why this topic is relevant, important today, and what the operators are doing to sort of drive this uh, trend up. Um, there you go. Um, and basically the topic, as I said, is how ISPs and mobile operators are up in the cross-platform gamer engagement. Um, these are trends you see all around us. This is Verizon, um, marketing to gamers, targeting gamers with the, the FIOS gigabit connection. And again, talking about lag and uh, minimizing lag and buffering. Uh, this is Cox Communications. Uh, the Elite Gamer Package is again targeted at gamers. Um, they again, talk about lag and you know, high bandwidth availability for gamers. And this again is a trend that you see with other ISPs in the US as well. Um, moving on from the US, this is uh, uh, is the UK. Um, this is Virgin Media, again, talking about gaming broadband and how it's, you know, it's super fast gaming broadband. It's going to help gamers. And there's a lot of uh, details around this um, front image. You can look up the Virgin Media website. And moving on from Europe, we also see this in Australia. Um, Telstra um, doing a lot of work with gamers in Australia and targeting gamers with the game optimizer package, talking about, uh, talking about low latency, um, guaranteed low latencies on the, on the network, uh, being able to control your home network. And obviously for an additional fee, you get all of this, uh, the game optimizer package. Uh, what do gamers expect here? Um, Simple answer, um, no misleading marketing. As you know, gamers are, 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 are sort of passionate at heart and they cannot be sold anything you want to sell them. So no BS marketing, uh, no lag across platforms. And this is something uh, we have as GameBench come across uh, talking to our users, our subscribers, our clients, that consistent experience across platforms is super important. Uh, and last but not the least, we always talk about data caps. If you're going to play cloud games on your mobile, it is going to suck up a lot of data. And we've been posed with this question quite often. So are we going to enter the world of no data caps? Uh, and that'll be interesting to know. Um, as you know, GameBench has been around for a while. Uh, what we do is we benchmark real world gaming experiences across platforms, across networks, across devices. Uh, and we combine uh, uh, our technology, our software with our field testing solutions so that we can actually go out and really see how gamers 
perceive gaming on different platforms, networks. And this is something we've been doing for the past two or three years, especially since the advent of cloud gaming. Um, and we did some work recently uh, is what does this in-game latency look like? And what we found was quite interesting. And this is something that's available on our website. You can have a look at it. And this is the latency. And what I mean latency here is that from, from the time you click on a button to the time you see a response in this end-to-end latency while playing Destiny 2 on a cloud gaming platform. And what we noticed was there was a wide distribution of latencies. If you are towards the left, you know, your responsiveness is pretty good. If you are towards the right, you are, there's room for improvement. Uh, we are somewhat at about 160 milliseconds as a median. That means there is uh, plenty of room for improvement. Um, and I would love to hear from the experts over here is how do we handle this? How do we target gamers and how do we bring them to um, adopt these platforms on mobile networks? Um, on that note, I would like to open a question to the, the operators on the panel. Um, I'm really curious to understand what are the factors driving up this trend um, and how you're reacting to this demand from the gamers. And conversely, what makes an ISP or mobile operator attractive to gamers? So shall I start with uh, uh, Matt Wallace from at and uh, Would you like to take the question? Yeah, sure. Thanks, uh, Sri. Glad to, glad to be here today. So. Um, looking across this, uh, cloud gaming is, in particular is arguably the, the most challenging type of application for consumers on our network today. The, the networks in the last 20 plus years just flat out weren't, weren't designed for this sort of real-time interactivity that, that gaming and especially cloud gaming um, uh, that re re requires milli milliseconds matter. and we see that, especially at you know some reports that that gamers and especially elite gamers have reaction times faster than Olympic athletes is is pretty pretty amazing. Now, having said that, um, it, most gaming and and, um, and and cloud gaming doesn't actually require um, super high bandwidth of you know hundreds of megabits per second or um, super low latency uh, based on the chart you were you were showing. Um, you know, five or 10 milliseconds of, of latency, which really important that uh, um, we believe in uh, through lots of conversations is consistency. Um, averages won't, won't cut it. Consistent bandwidth, consistent latency, because um, it's the one packet where you're trying to, to duck when you're being shot at that can be the difference between you winning, the length, uh, winning or losing the game if it's, um, if it's delayed or, or lost. And um, now, consistency takes uh, uh, a number of forms. If you're um, we're dealing with fiber networks, AT and T, you know it's a, it's a bit easier as you were just showing. Um, AT and T's got really broad fiber networks covering 15 million homes in the United States on its way to 30 million over the next few years. But most people, um, probably not the you know highest end gamers, but most people who even with a fiber connection are are um, are using Wi-Fi to connect, and Wi-Fi is notoriously variable and inconsistent in its um, in its performance. Um, then you've got um, uh, cellular networks and even with with 5G, AT&T again has got a huge um, uh, a huge network for, for 5G covering about 250 million Americans. Um, uh, 5G is faster, but just having fiber and 5G alone isn't enough to provide the consistency that that we need. It is um, it's newer technologies that build on top of those um, what, uh, those, those capabilities, things like network slicing, edge computing, the ability to get real-time uh, performance data out of the network, which are going to make um, make the difference and be able to provide the the consistency that the uh, customers in in gaming and other advanced applications are going to demand. Uh, thanks, Matt. Um, to just uh continue on that point. Um, and that's the American view, which is good to hear. Uh, what are the Canadians and the Europeans saying? Gunjan, should I, do you want to take a, uh, take a stab at this? Sure. Um, I think, uh, first of all, um, we need to understand that, you know, what is driving this trend. So, uh, you know, I always say that uh, when 3G was launched, it was all about, you know, music streaming. Uh, and then when 4G was launched, it was all about video streaming. Those things were very popular on the, you know, telco side of things. And, uh, but, you know, 5G and gaming is very different. And the reason uh, now gaming is 
so popular and cloud gaming has become so popular among telcos is because, um, you know, in video and in music, you could stream things, you could buffer things, but gaming is totally different. It's interactive. If you're playing competitive gaming or even, you know, if you're playing a shooter game and there's even few milliseconds of latency, even five milliseconds of latency, your whole experience is destroyed. That's why I think, you know, 5G and even uh, more demanding networks and high performance networks has it become even important. Uh, from, uh, you know, this is from the technical perspective, but also, uh, you know, cloud gaming is driving more economical form of, uh, you know, gaming with subscriptions and, uh, you know, bringing uh, different experience of removing things like no need to wait for the downloads um, and, you know, getting instant play with the games. So subscription is another thing that I see that uh, for telcos, uh, you know, they've been driving uh, subscription um, for music and music streaming and video streaming so that is something that you know uh, like an operator like vodafone can help in driving adoption to that subscription which is new for gamers so this is what i see in europe especially uh, when we look at the landscape of platforms uh, for in core gaming still pc and console is a bigger platform and mobile is still growing like uh, in apac or other regions uh, mobile is growing super fast, but you know, in, in Europe, still PC and console are the biggest platforms. So with these new networks, with cloud gaming, uh, there, there's also a role that uh, telcos and ISPs are uh, playing to make gaming bigger on mobile and getting that AAA high, you know, graphic and experience to mobile. So that's kind of the European view that I see. That's uh, thank you very much for that, Gunjin. Uh, Chris, on the Canadian side, uh, what are you what are you seeing? What's the trend? And also along the same lines, you know, how, how I also want to know from all three of you, how are gamers reacting to this uh, these campaigns? Are they reacting sort of very enthusiastically or with uh, a bit of skepticism? Thanks, Ray. Yeah, um, I guess one of the perks of going last in these panels is I get to ride on the tailcoats of Matthew and and Gunjin. Um, I think the the Canadian perspective is identical to what they've described, right? At the end of the day, um, what gamers really, really need and, and what they want is a consistent connection that's going to enable them to do what they want to do, right? I, I think about it, you know, similar to my own experiences playing soccer, right? Like the, the experience playing soccer on a really nice level field is way better than playing on something that's, you know, less than farmer's field with bumps on it and everywhere. It's, it's truly night and day. So... At the end of the day, if you really want to provide the right experience for gamers, uh, that's what you need to prioritize is just creating this level playing field for everyone so that they can have that experience. Um, so from a technical perspective, I think that's what, what you need to drive towards. And from a business perspective, uh, tell us that's what we've been trying to promote in market. Uh, we have similarly to the, the, the pages that you're showing at the beginning of the presentation, uh, you know, we have dedicated microsites speaking directly to gamers, uh, and we see when we when we promote gaming specific campaigns and market, the response from gamers is huge. Uh, again, at the end of the day, this is a group of people that's very passionate about their internet connection, uh, and it's something that they prioritize, right? Just like any hobbyist, uh, a soccer player wants to play in the the right field, a cook wants to have the right ingredients. You know, this is something that's that's central to their experience, and and so we find uh, yeah a great amount of engagement from gamers in the community when we when we focus on the messaging on speaking to them and, and what they need. Uh, that's really good to hear. Now I'm going to switch gears and move to, to Nvidia for a second because at the end of the day we are talking about cloud gaming and that has been a recent trend. Uh, I know native gaming on PCs, Gunjan, as you mentioned, is still very popular, and um, we've seen that. Mobile is picking up when it comes to um, cloud gaming, but it still seems to be quite predominant on, uh, on on PCs at the moment. But NVIDIA is delivering this experience on both our PCs and mobile. So Sean, um, I'd love to hear from you uh, in terms of, um, there's been a lot of an emphasis on cloud gaming from GeForce now. Um, yep. Are the tech barriers going down? Um, do you see an increase in adoption uh, among mobile players? and players at home who are probably used to Xbox and you know more powerful consoles. Love to hear from you on that. Yeah, it, it's a great question. And, and certainly, you know, we, we as a company have been investing in cloud gaming for over a decade now, right? Uh, NVIDIA is synonymous with PC gaming, right? Our technology is the foundation of PC gamers globally. Uh, you know, we're the leading market provider of graphics cards uh, for PC gamers. Mm -hmm. 
And we really wanted to start working on, you know, a solution on really addressing kind of the next billion gamers out there globally, right? Whether they're playing on a Mac, a PC, a Chromebook, or a phone, right? And that's where GeForce Now really comes in. And this is a product that we introduced several years ago. It went through forms of beta, and then we released it to the public a couple of years ago alongside our Android phone application. I would say at that time, you know, a lot of 5G networks really had not been deployed in full. Uh, but certainly over the last two years, we've probably seen the percentage of our gameplay go from less than 5% on top of mobile to really closer to 10 to 15%. So we have seen a significant amount of growth as those 5G networks have been deployed, as well as as we've expanded around the globe. You know, we have a number of telco focused partnerships in places like Asia, Australia, Latin America, the Middle East, even Russia, uh, where today we now operate over 30 data centers uh, and being able to reach, you know, really tens of millions of gamers uh, through a cloud gaming experience. So I think you know, the combination of the hardware being more, much more efficient can sit closer to those gamers on a global basis, as well as the combination of these high speed internet plans, as well as 5G networks are really just the start of being able to access that technology. I think some of what the uh, the panelists from the telco side have mentioned in terms of, you know, focusing on low latency doxis prioritizing packets, network slicing, those things are going to really take it to the next level, improve those quality of service metrics that, you know, a lot of these cloud gamers are focused on and really deliver a great PC gaming experience, you know, on whatever device that you want to play on today. And, and, and Sean, do you see a, a new breed of gamers coming into play, given that in the, the promise of cloud gaming or, or, or network centric gaming is that you, you know, play anything anywhere sort of sort of uh, perspective? Are you seeing more families, I mean, getting on board, playing games together in a social setting or, you know, you know, women who are actually becoming more avid gamers? Do you see the trend picking up? It's a great question. I think there's two predominant people that really come into cloud gaming. You know, first and foremost, it is really targeted at people who cannot afford to build a gaming PC, right? A gaming PC today, if, if you want a high-end rig, you're talking about thousands of dollars. Um, but even around the globe, even if you're going to build a pretty standard gaming PC, you're talking about eight, nine, one hundred thousand dollars. Even a game console, several hundred dollars. You know, cloud gaming is really targeted at those people. Um, who can't necessarily afford it and want to play on just a, you know, or pay on a per month basis. And now you're getting access to that thousand dollar gaming PC from the cloud and being able to play all the games that you want to play with your friends. I think the second trend that we're also seeing is, you know, a lot of teenagers, people who are in college that are playing Fortnite with their friends really just want to join in on the action. And you can't do that on your standard laptop, right? And so, Gaming inherently is social in nature. You know, people want to play with their friends, their family. Uh, and we typically see a lot of people use NVIDIA GeForce Now as one of their first uh, gaming platforms to play like games like Fortnite, right? That are very social, interactive, and that they want to play with. And then you also see their parents on the flip side who might have been a, a reformed or a past gamer now come into the fold. They don't want to go through the hassle of building a gaming PC and they can just jump on GeForce Now and play alongside them. Uh, thanks a lot for that, Sean. I think, I think I'm going to come back to you with a couple more questions and just in terms of the shift of competition from a powerful PC at home to the cloud and what it means to a publisher and what it means in terms of game economics. Uh, we'll we'll touch upon that in a few, a few minutes. Um, uh, Gino, uh, welcome to the panel. Um, Thank you. Uh, you you sit in, at Nokia. You sit at, at from from your vantage point. You sit in the sort of the center of the ecosystem. You have the luxury of working with a lot of people in the ecosystem, all the way from developers, publishers to uh, the operators here. Uh, what is the trend you see in terms of uh, gaming? And you know, talking about technologies coming, low latency technologies coming into the market. What what's happening? And how have you reacted to the, to these trends coming in? Well, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, and I am a little bit biased because I'm a huge gamer myself. So I'll, I'll put my own little spin on it. But I, I love listening to what Matthew and, and Chris and everybody had, had talked about here. Um, 
and and of course the technology is there. There's so many tools available uh, in terms of what we can do with network slicing, what we can do with, with packet prioritization, with L4S, with you no know, low latency docs, as was mentioned uh, earlier, and some of the queuing algorithms and things like that. So I, I think the, the technology is there. When I look at the engagement, though, this it's kind of funny me coming from a technology company, but when we look at the engagement, gamers it's a broad term, a gamer that somebody that cares about gaming classifies and gamer isn't just going to play gaming, he's going to want to stream gaming, he's going to watch people stream the game and all of these things have to be put in consideration on what that means for for engagement like uh, I was looking at, uh, at what AT&T and, and Matthew I want to give kudos for what you did with the Batman uh, launch there with the I, I thought it was absolutely brilliant, because that's the kind of thing that in, of uh, customer engagement. And if you want, uh, Shri, I actually have a really cool slide I want to share with you guys about what that means. Because people say, well, yeah. are gamers, gamers willing to, to spend? And what does that mean? And uh, I, I did a, an ITF uh, Internet Architecture Board workshop that I participated in for three days with some of the, 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 the people a lot smarter than I was. But what I was able to, to bring to market is when we talk about gaming and improving latency, are people willing to pay for that? Like people for, pay for bandwidth now. I go and I buy you know, 10 megabits, 100 megabits, a gigabit. But yeah, over 60 plus percent of people are willing to pay between you know almost 10 and $20 a month for a latency sensitive experience. And or, you know, the other interesting question is, well, do I want to buy something that is gaming specific or do I want to be able to manage it? Well, you know, there's, I think there's place for both. It's not mutually exclusive. But what that meant also for the CSP is we did a, a project with a, a 5G customer in Europe, and uh, they found that their NPS score went up uh, significantly, you know, by 20 at the end, because we're able to, you know, reduce video issues, reduce, you know, cloud gaming issues, reduce Wi-Fi issues by focusing on latency. So the, the, the market is there, but it's not just about providing you no know, good latency. It's about providing a, a rounded experience. Am I going to play well? Am I going to stream well? Am I going to be able to watch well? All of these things is what really is going to bring that that uh, consumer engagement. At least for me, like I said, I'm taking a little bit of bias approach as a gamer. I'm I'm excited. This is Friday. Apex season 11 is coming out next week, so I'll be playing tonight. Finish my rank season and everything else. But but consumer engagement, you got to look more to. If you're just telling me I'm getting off your low latency, that's not enough. Matthew was right. You got to offer consistent, but you, the engagement goes beyond that. Can I stream? Can I have a good streaming experience? Can I watch other people while doing it and everything else? All of these things need to be to get to come together. And do you see a difference in mobile PC? I mean, I know you are uh, yeah. PC, is there a difference in trend because of 5G that you see? I, I, there, there is, but but here's the thing: I, the the difference in trend, I think, is an evolution. You know, I I consider myself a little bit of the old generation when when I went and bought internet access, uh, I was buying DSL, I was buying fiber, I was buying cable. That pe people don't care about that. When I talk to my daughter that's 19 going to university, she's like, "Who's got the best Wi-Fi?" Like I, I I don't really care, and I don't care what's underneath it. It could be a 5G service, it could be whatever. They, they don't care. So I think we're in a transition phase where generation, the, the new generations, it doesn't matter what the low layer technology was, they're really looking at good connectivity and they're willing to pay for that connectivity in different ways than we did. They're not just about buying bandwidth. I wanna buy a good experience. So, so I think there's a shift. Uh, it is, you know, the, as the, the new generation comes in, they're looking at things differently and they're looking for different things as well. Uh, thanks a lot for that, Jada. I mean, I'm always, uh, I'm always here, curious to hear the gamer perspective. Uh, because at the end of the day, I mean, you have the price tag in front of you. Uh, would you pay yeah. twenty dollars per month extra to get that service? And that, that is something that I have, I want to pose back to uh, the the operators here. Um, do you see operators putting an SLA in place so that there is guaranteed bandwidth and latency? Is that something? as a trend we're about to see in the market that we haven't seen before, because I see a lot of marketing saying, oh, we have the highest bandwidth and I run a nuclear test. And it's like, well, it's it's not at 400 Mbps, it's maybe a lot less than 100, but the the packaging says something else. So, Well, SLAs are tough because you're not offering a managed service, you know, where an SLA could be enforced the same way that you do an enterprise connectivity and whatnot. But what I think is you can offer a different service. You can offer a preferred service. And I'm not talking about anything that would violate net neutrality and all that, but you can offer a differentiated gaming experience 
uh, that is better than your competition, that is good for the gamer without having necessarily to go to an SLA. Because at the end of the day, we're still working with technology that is subject to outside interference and all kinds of different things. It, you know, unless it's a fully managed service, then it's that's really tough to to be able to enforce. Got it. Uh, Matt, Chris, and Gunyan, what do you what do you think about that? Uh, you know, putting something a bit more concrete in place, a guaranteed bandwidth, guaranteed latency. Is is that something we're going to see? Um, and are gamers like Gino going to be happy that we have a guarantee? What are your thoughts on that? Well, it, I'll I'll start here. So. Uh, um, as uh, Gina was saying, end-to-end -end guarantees are 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 going to be uh, are going to be tough. But um, the key, there really is a key to do um, uh, to have a differentiated experience for for the customer. It's not just enough, as we say, to you know have a you know one gig internet service or to to say that you you've got five G. Those technologies by themselves don't don't solve the, the the real problem of of consistency across here and so how do you how do you create a um, a service where you can provide a differentiated level of, of experience of consistency that's that's noticeable to, to customers um, there are definitely new technologies coming in today as I was talking you know network slicing um, different sorts of intelligent QoS um, on on Wi-Fi Wi-Fi networks, um, somebody mentioned L4S um, before. Their um, edge computing also. Um, I think edge computing is um, certainly won't help with with everything when you're talking multiplayer games, but for um, um, some single player gaming experience, ed edge computing is going to be um, pretty critical to being able to provide some um, uh, service level guarantees. Because while you don't quite um, have a end-to-end uh, -end managed service with that um, by moving the the compute infrastructure to to a you know effectively a controlled location, not not having the traffic go over the uh, uh, the internet. That's hugely important. It's why you know AT and T in, in these spaces. It's why we're we're um, you know working not just to deploy five G, but to deploy standalone five G, so we can do um, stand, uh, network slicing. And why we're working with leading uh, cloud providers in order to, to deploy um, edge computing um, locations to, to support these new capabilities. Um, Chris and Gunyan, what do you think about the, uh, the, the some kind of a guarantee for gamers given that the marketing is targeted at them? Same as Gino and uh, Matthew said, like gaming community is highly engaged and very smart community. And in some ways they're very demanding as well. So uh, I think one thing that I've noticed is that you know, in pandemic, especially when there's been multi-use um, bandwidth uh, division at the home. So, you know, giving importance to gamers has become even more important so that, you know, they have enough bandwidth to play uh, the games that they want to. But, you know, in case of multiplayer, like Matthew said, it's very difficult to control and give guaranteed SLAs. You don't know you know, who's playing at other locations. But there are technologies like in Europe, especially, you know, when we look at QoS or prioritization of traffic with APIs and everything, there's a, you know, difficulty with the net, net neutralities and regulations. So there's still, you know, a lot of work that needs to be done to uh, provide that guaranteed uh, network speeds and more than network speed, it's more like, you know, jitter free and very reliable network for the gamers to play. So that's what I see in Europe mainly. Um, I think because, it's a it's a challenge yeah. that um sorry guys I just um we had um we, we selected a a carrier for a reason we we use Vodafone in the UK and the, the reason that um we selected them as our IP carriers that they were willing to work with us um on a number of peering relationships to make sure that we're not transversing the internet on certain traffic streams mm -hmm. um and the, the other thing that we're working on is there's there's a team sat at Vodafone at the moment playing with multiple gaming servers so we can analyze what um what profiles we might apply to, to each user because you know for, for my house I, i've got a few kids my wife watches a, a lot of stuff streaming like there's a lot of stuff going on in my internet any one time there's a lot of different traffic and ip streams just you know going off back to a server somewhere so you know a a is the is the backhaul back to that that data center you know as, as good as it could be and, and then can we do some clever things as an isp to say well actually look we know that from that end user device because they've got a you know a high-end router that i know that that traffic stream there is is a gaming stream can i prioritize and elevate that bandwidth alone as opposed to the netflix stream so if my wife's watching some documentary <laughs> then uh, you know can we prioritize the gaming traffic 
can we prioritize the element of bandwidth from quality of service? So the, the flow for that gaming um, stream, especially with cloud gaming is, is, is on point. And I think that's, that's some of the stuff that, that we're trying to work on, but there's a lot of factors to that. You know, the, the, the carrier that you've got to use has got to have the right hardware. The end user has got to have the right hardware at home and you've got to have, you can't just have a, a 30 quid, uh, you know, really crappy old Wi-Fi router. You've got to have a, a really good intelligent device yeah. to be able to do that. Yeah, uh, very, uh, very well said, Johnny. Um, and Johnny, on, on that note, um, as we know, Zyber is the new kid around the block. And in the UK, you are sort of, I would say, disrupting the market in some ways. But I'd love to hear about how you're bundling things, especially for the uh, for the for the home, and what does it look like, and what were the what were the drivers for creating something like Cyber? <laughs> uh, well, I've, you know, I've always been a gamer. Um, so, you know, my, my gaming days go back to Mega Drive, I think, even though I don't really look that old. So um, <laughs> gaming was always a really cool thing for me. And if you, if you look at you know, anything that's happened over the years, you know, music went to streaming and then, and then TV did it and that, you know, the tech wasn't really there. You know, I think there's a, there was quite a few big companies that tried to take on TV streaming before the world was really ready for it. Um, and then we've, you know, we've, we've seen companies um, try, try to do the same in cloud gaming over the last, you know, 10 years, I think. And, um, you know, the tech's not really been there in the UK. We're going through this massive change to, to everyone going to full fiber connectivity, which is, you know, which is great. So, um, you know, hopefully in the next four years, in most of the country will have one gig internet connections um so that the text you know it's ready it, cloud gaming is is ready to sort of take over the world in most countries and what we wanted to do at zyber was just create something a little different so you know a home entertainment bundle that includes cloud gaming um yeah you know, i think it's the it's the first of its kind in the uk and there's a there's a few examples across the globe so you know why couldn't your home entertainment package you know move from that traditional tv market and include gaming as a service and i think uh, we've seen it happen a lot with some of the mobile companies um you know, a couple of guys on this on this panel probably have you know really big mobile bases that you know cloud gaming is a is a huge win for them uh, on, on that note um one one interesting trend that i've noticed is uh, in terms of bundling um we see the bundles of you know disney or netflix coming together from operators and that happens even when i go into a verizon store today you know you can you can get um uh, one of the streaming packages and now there's stadia or, or one of the cloud gaming packages being added on what do you see is the uptick? I often hear that it's it's people tend to choose the streaming platform over cloud gaming. Is that a trend that you see or is that trend starting to change a bit? Uh, I mean, we're working on both, actually. We're working on a, a complete home entertainment package. And I think the way that users watch TV specifically in the UK and, and probably the world has changed the way where everyone um, you know, has a choice of what of what they want to watch. You know, I, in, in my house, we have, you know, all of them. We have <laughs> Netflix and Disney and Prime and Crunchyroll. And, and there's, you know, there's a whole world of them. And I think I think that's the same with, with some of the gaming companies. So, you know, you get a little bit for everybody. You know, NVIDIA caters for, you know, hardcore gamers. And, you know, there's over a thousand games games that you can play without the need for hardware but you know there's a few other companies that are doing some really great things so you know with Zyber specifically with our own gaming app we wanted to put a load of casual and kids games on there so we've got the family element you know you don't need to own the game you can you can just play mm -hmm. it there's a uh, companies like Antstream Arcade which have like a thousand retro games so you can play stuff like Rampage and and all the other old favorites to to rekindle with those gray gamer market and then yeah. you know you've got a few others that you know that and I think that we just added like 200 HTML5 games so those hyper casual things that my kids will spend hours on end playing on the phone, you know, they can now play with their TV remote, which I, which I think is really cool. Um, not only that, they can play it across any device that you have in your household. Oh, that's, that's really good to know, Johnny. Um, on, on that note, I want to sort of switch back to um, um, to Sean on NVIDIA because one one thing that has been brought up in, is, is in terms of game economics and business models. Um, again, when it comes to packaging gaming one either through you know your bundle cyber a cyber kind of bundles or adding on cloud gaming on top of the mobile operator package that you can get um, at the end of the day there has to be an economy that works for everybody and one thing we've heard consistently is you know cloud gaming is is too expensive so you're shifting the competition from your local device to the cloud um, I would actually use my PC for competition, but now, now somebody else gonna, is going to pay for that in the cloud. So Sean, Sean I, I, I want to pose this question to you. How do you see that economy is going to change uh, where the, the, the cost of competition is moved to the cloud and, and are, are gamers and publishers going to use that model? Is that going to be more streamlined in the future? 
It's a good question. And <clears throat> this is, you know, a technology that we've been building for, for over the last decade. And we actually just announced our third generation pod based infrastructure last week called the GeForce Now SuperPod. Um, and it's going to bring all new capabilities to cloud gaming. It's going to provide the best end to end experience. Uh -huh. So up to 1440p, 120 frames per second on the PC and Mac, you know, on your shield, you can actually do up to 4K HDR. And so you're gonna get these really premium experiences. And even on the phone, for example, we're gonna stream 120 Hertz, right? And some of these new phones that are coming out do support that. And so you're gonna have this really, really great cloud gaming experience on every device that you have. I think each generation that comes along, the economics of cloud gaming continue to improve. You know, we have a number of different go-to-market strategies in North America, as well as Western Europe. Uh, we run and operate that service ourselves, right? So we're, we're deploying our GPU pod-based infrastructure and co-location data centers all across the US, Western Europe, and then offering a direct-to-consumer service to those customers for you know, $10 a month, or we just introduced our 3080 and we're starting off with pre-orders for six months for 100 US dollars. And that service will be coming uh, here quite soon in the US in December for, uh, for Europe. Uh, internationally, we do have a different model. And so we do partner typically with a telco to get that infrastructure locally in their data centers on top of their networks and they do a lot of the marketing and billing direct to consumer, right? And so they have a lot of different go-to-market strategies. They could be bundling it in with some of their top tiered 5G or internet plans. They could be selling it on a standalone basis, um, or they could be doing a combination of all of those things, right? And I think it's a great opportunity for them to, you know, not only acquire new users and coming to their internet service provider, but also, you know, as a way to upsell to some of these new, you know, technologies like a gigabit ethernet plan or a 5G plan. And so I think there's a lot of great ways to monetize cloud gaming. And mm -hmm. I think over time, we'll continue to improve those economics uh, to where the, you know, entire ecosystem is, is doing quite well. Uh, thanks, yeah, I'm, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated with all the changes in, um, in business models that we're just starting to, to see with, with this. I think that's the most exciting, one of the most, you know, beyond the games itself, one of the most exciting things that we're, we're experiencing here. And with, um, you know, these, these trends aren't necessarily new. We saw them, you know, five to 10 years ago, starting in the video space with, um, you know, you, you don't go to Blockbuster um, anymore. Uh, hardly anybody, you know, rents a, you know, video on demand movie from their, um, you know, from their, their cable company. Um, instead, we've got, we've got streaming from the cloud. You have, um, you have subscription services instead of uh, a la carte, and you've got got these direct to customer relationships um, and services starting to starting to to form. And those are things we've seen entirely in the video space, but beforehand. But now we're now we're seeing those in the in the in the gaming space, and it's it's creating lots and lots of new opportunities. When as Gina was was mentioning, when when uh, we last week launched. Um, uh, Batman Arkham Knight for our uh, uh, for our for our wireless customers. It's one of the things that we were trying to um, uh, to demonstrate. And um, you know, on that we worked with uh, you know Google and their platform as a as a service um, on the the, the back end, um, kind of the same thing that that runs runs Stadia, in order to create a you know, really frictionless front end for for the customers in order to demonstrate, you know. Any any telco, any game publisher, um, anyone wants to bring new new experiences to customers. I mean, in a matter of you know, um, uh, you know, weeks or you know, very few months, um, uh, you know, we were able to you know stand stand up that that capability um, for, for our customers. Great experience. You got to. Um, I'm going to you know, put in a plug, www.att.com slash play Batman, put in your phone number um, uh, as an AT&T customer and, and in seconds you're, you're playing and just, to, you know, imagine that sort of thing, you know, living anywhere on the internet in the, the new business models um, for, for publishers, for game developers, for, you know, um, indies and startups to, to big companies of what they can, they can do with, um, with something like that. It's really amazing what we're starting to see now.
Uh, Matt, I think I'm almost convinced that I should move to AT&T. Um, I'm not on your, on your network at the moment, but maybe you can strike me a special deal. Gunjan, what do you see uh, happening in Europe? Because one thing I've always thought about is the European market is slightly behind uh, the US from a gaming perspective, because obviously the US and China have the biggest gaming populations. How do you see business models evolving in Europe? Do you see a specific trend emerging? So gaming generally, you know, as an uh, entertainment industry, when we compare to video and when we compare to music, it's the fastest going, growing industry, right? And the impact is also happening in Europe. So mobile, um, mobile and gaming on its own is growing. So when, uh, you know, telco spend so much in infrastructure and creating, you know, 5G networks, plus bringing uh, on, the, on the, you know, fixed side, uh, improved high performance network, we want to give differentiated experience to the customers, we want to uh, give them something in terms of content and bundles to try that. So gaming is something, you know, which has on its own become more complicated, the worlds that are created in the games, they are more complex, they are more, uh, you know, really high end graphics, high quality. So we want uh, customers to use our technology, use our infrastructure and experience those things. So with this change, it's happening, but it's right that, you know, the way it's happening in China and US, it's not at that pace, but that change and that movement is happening uh, in, in Europe as well. Um, what about um, Canada, Chris? Uh, what do you see, how do you see the evolution of these business models um, changing in the near future? I think uh, we're starting to see this shift um, towards uh, where gaming is following the evolution that the video services industry did. Um, I think what Matt's done at at and kudos, hat off to you. I think that's awesome. Um, but I know as well, you know, the natural gravity of the industry is publishers are wanting to start going direct to consumer, right? And so I think we're going to start seeing the industry evolving in this direction where publishers are able to spin up their own offerings, just like Matt has done at at and um, and so we're going to start to see, I think, the industry start to fragment along those lines a little bit more. And me as a telco operator, I'm actually quite excited about this. I think uh, we as, as operators have a lot of value to add in this space, right? We're a foundational bill. Uh, we have the bundling capabilities that uh, Johnny's going after and Zyber. Um, and so, you know, in an industry where the cost of actually creating these services and the cost of developing games is so high, in managing things like churn, cost of customer acquisition, things like that. That's something that we at Telcos do very, very well, right? That's, that's the bread and butter of our, of our business. And so I think the future of cloud gaming is actually a union between, you know, the, the game publishers and producers, cloud gaming platforms and Telcos who can optimize the service, optimize customer acquisition uh, and actually tie the whole experience together. So I'm really excited about the direction of where that's going. and. I think uh, one thing to me as well that uh, we haven't really touched on in this call and it's a, a bit outside the scope, but I think what cloud gaming is gonna do is really democratize access to gaming in a way that it doesn't really exist today. You know, I think if you start to look at the stats and see where kids, the, these upcoming generation, Gen Z and beyond are spending a lot of their time, a lot of their time is spent gaming and a lot of social interaction for these, these demographics is spent online as well. And so, uh, it kind of breaks my heart to think that some kids are not able to afford access to these kind of experiences because they can't afford a high-end gaming PC or they can't afford a, a console, you know. So I think we're going to start to see as the industry fragments and evolves and cloud gaming becomes more and more uh, endemic to the system, we're also going to start seeing more and more people engaging in a way that they haven't been able to before. And I think it's going to create a really, really beautiful industry, really vibrant industry as it evolves more than today. Old. I think I think we're waiting for that industry to uh, pick up. And, and Gunjan, I, I take some of the comments you made on our previous call is where I think there's there's ways to go for cloud gaming. Um, it's just that you know it's it's up and coming, and we're seeing the trajectory. But I think a lot of things have to fall into place for that. All the way from from the business models, from technology to latency to the game behavior, bundling of that to make it attractive. I think a lot of these things do have to fall into place. So I I, I take your point uh, well, Chris, on that. Um, I, I do want to touch upon a couple of questions coming in from the audience. Um, the first one really was from an anonymous Tandy. Uh, Gino and Johnny touched upon this, but how can telcos provide differentiated service for gamers without uh, falling foul of net neutrality? Are you seeing any flexibility from regulators to allow some, of, some form of traffic prioritization? Or do you think it can already be done without incurring net neutrality issues? So um, who wants to take that? I know Gino, you responded. Uh, yeah, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll take a quick... 
still cut it. So the you know the the basic concept for net neutrality was really do do no harm in providing a fast bat for your service or fast bat for other services and things like that. And, and really, that's slightly different. What we're trying to do there is provide a traffic queuing efficiencies and you know in in managing that. So it's not that we're limiting bandwidth to particular application. Not at all. We're not that's not what we're about is we're providing a more consistent traffic profile, which today to be honest, the end user can go at the you know Best Buy or Staples and buy a gaming router and do the same thing at home. You know, and probably not nearly as efficiently as a service provider could. So yeah, so I, this does not violate net neutrality. We're not providing a or paying for a fast path to a given service. We're basically managing the traffic at the request of the end user. So it's the end user that decides, you know, what he wants and, and what he's willing to do there. So yeah, it's definitely possible. I've personally been involved in, in dozens of projects uh, like this around the world, Canada, US, Europe, Asia, and in no cases did did we run into any net neutrality issues, whatever, if it's done properly? But yeah, there are mechanisms and tools and technology that can be do that can be used that will not violate net neutrality here. Any comments from the operators in the call? I think it's an interesting question for sure. Uh, net neutrality is obviously an important consideration. Uh, I think an opportunity for operators is. Um, where we are actually able to provide some kind of managed service, just like we do with our TV services today, right? We're, we're able to trust that traffic as it transits our network. Um, and so I think if you think about a future where operators are able to build in gaming services, just like Matt has done with Sadia into our set top box experiences and, and you know, kind of own this, and, and this is a TELUS service, for example, I think there's opportunities to prioritize that traffic within our own network uh, without violating net neutrality. Um, and so I think that's a, that's a key opportunity that we see on the horizon for sure. Yeah, I'll, uh, um, you know, agree with uh, what, what Gina was, was saying there, but, it, but extend, you know, to, to add something that he didn't was, was that um, uh, another kind of key, key component there is what, anything that's done in this space needs to be um, agnostic to the, um, the, the, the service provider out there, not preferencing, you know, one company or over, over another and kind of picking and choosing winners. That's the whole, that's the whole concept behind this. And, and um, um, so, um, you know, create business models and capabilities um, that, that support um, that, that support that, that'll be a really important kind of key to, um, to delivering, not just for gaming, but a, you know, a next generation of, of services, um, you know, across lots of different things from augmented reality, the metaverse and things like that in the future, um, the, the old networks aren't going to support them and, and new capabilities need to be provided in order to support those services. Exactly. I mean, on the on the lines of what Matthew has said, um, you know, it, it's about giving a, a great experience. So it's, you know, net neutrality is a sensitive issue, but I think there's a, a potential to work together with the, you know, game developer community and optimize the networks that, you know, we can deliver that um, quality uh, and experience uh, without being into the, you know, net neutrality and prioritization side of, side of things. I think it uh, depends on what you're doing too, right? I mean, I, I'd I mean, I know it's I know it's technically possible, but you know, if you're playing um, an F, you know, a, a frames per second game, you, you you want lower latency, and like there's a network profile that can give you lower latency, and you know, maybe if you're playing a big open world single player game, you probably want a bit more bandwidth. And maybe it can like it can you know it can load the the big open world spaces uh, a little bit better and give you and give you better graphical views and I know you know all those things are possible but you know we're not really there on the tech side for an ISP to go well that that person's playing an an SFP and can we change the gaming profile from their end user device all the way back to the the data center um, but you know those things are you know are coming um, for for a lot of people right. Yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks for that. I, I have another question which has been lined up here, uh, and I think Gino, you you threw in your comments anyway. Um, so thanks for that. I want to ask a panelist. This is from Angit Kang. Um, I want to ask a panelist if CDN deployment for a particular game is driven by some sort of customer based analysis, or is it taken purely based on popularity measured by a random survey?
Do you know you want to go again? Yeah, no, I, and so my, my answer was it's it's not mutually exclusive. So the game studios that I've personally worked with and dealt with, when they, they launch the triple gay games, they typically have an idea of, of where data day centers they'll use and whatever, and they'll get a good worldwide geographic uh, distribution, you know, based on, on what they know their, their latency requirements and whatnot. That being said, they do careful analysis. And so for example, when uh, I use Apex Legend, because I love the game, but when Apex Legend launched, there was maybe, uh, you know, uh, I think it was like nine, 10 data centers. And now if you go look at the list two years after, there's probably, you know, 20 plus something. So as they, as they, as they mature and understand the demographics, their player base and whatnot, then they can go deeper and deeper and more regionalized and more regionalized. So, so I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. I think they're, uh, at least the, the AAA studios are wise enough to know what they need for a game launch. I, I say that knowing there's a lot of launch that failed because they're not a server capacity and whatnot, but the, but that's a different issue. Uh, but yeah, and but they do use uh, uh, usage and analytics to know where to go forward. And this is also very important to, for for provider history because uh, uh, we we had a situation uh, in Canada where a certain game was now available on AWS Canada uh, because they had a lot of Canadian users. Yet a uh, particular operator was uh, routing all of the AWS Canada traffic to AWS US instead of having using a direct pairing, which was available. So adding an extra 18 hops. So, you know, the, there needs to be an understanding there from the operator as well, if you're serious about gaming to, to be able to prioritize your traffic accordingly, to be able to take advantage of it. So, but yeah, it, it's, it, the, the two are not mutually exclusive. They do both. Got it. Sean, from NVDF's perspective, do, do you see, do you see how do, do you have recommendations how things should get deployed? Because at the end of the day, I mean, the, the game is being served from your server. And if it's not served correctly and it's going through 18 or 20 additional hops, uh, I think the user is going to think something's wrong with the game, you know, but it's nothing to do with the, uh, the cloud gaming platform here. Um, is there something that you uh, recommend to, to, to sort of uh, operators and how one one should be deployed, one platform should be deployed on the network? It's a good question and it's it's a complicated one. So <clears throat> let's just take the, the US, for example, where you know we have nine data centers across uh, the United States to service a, a very large user base. So from, from that user's perspective, when they're actually clicking that pixel on their gamepad or keyboard and mouse or whatever it might be, it's sent to the data center and then that frame is actually rendered within that data center, right? And sometimes you are then connecting from that data center ultimately to that multiplayer game server, right? And so sometimes you can actually provide a better experience already being in that sort of centralized data center, having, let's call it, you know, multiple IP transit vendors who are then servicing uh, those end customers. You know, I think the things that we can do to improve that uh, experience is sometimes looking at direct pairing relationships, you know, identifying where users are having unusually high latency. Um, you know, so for example, I think we did an analysis in like El Paso, Texas, and we have a data center in Dallas and they were experiencing unusually high uh, latency. And so we contacted the ISP, we tried to understand what are their peering points and then you can really focus on, okay, this group of users have now dramatically seen their performance increase. And so there's a lot of little things like that across the network that you can look to improve for, you know, that full end-to-end -end experience. You're not gonna get every single one, uh, but certainly there's, there's a number of them out there uh, as well. Cool. And that actually brings me to a question that's very, very close to uh, to us at GameBench. Uh, we, we spoke about experience quite a few times. And in the past few meetings uh, with, with operators and anyone in the space, the, the, the objective quantification of gamer experience is always a big question. We talk about latency, we talk about the number of hops, but how do you quantify a good gaming experience is, is, <laughs> is baffling because no one's been able to do that accurately. And we at GameMage have, have our own method uh, to quantify it. I'd love to understand from all of you, are we missing a game experience rating system that you know you can deliver against, promise on? And clearly there's a market for this because I can always say uh, we can deliver X level of game experience for an additional $20 per month. So is that something missing? Are we, are we sort of shooting in the dark without having a very clear benchmark or target for what a good game experience should be? Um, I know it's a bit of a curveball, but I'll throw it back to the panel. 
Gina's laughing. I yeah, I'm, I'm laughing because, it, you know, it's kind of like asking someone, what's your favorite pizza? You know, what, what makes a pizza good for me? It, it's so subjective in nature, but yeah. it, is, it is a very valid question, Sri. And, and at the end of it, even though everybody will have a preferred pizza, there are some key metrics that, that are common to each one of them. You know, so there is a need for something like that. I'm hoping GameBench is, is going to, you know, is going to provide something there because it's really hard for me. We get, I, I get asked a question, how can I make my network better than the competitors for gaming? Well, geez, where do I start? I, I don't know. Like what does that, who are your gamers? What do they play? It could be a million things. So it's important to have a common set of fundamentals that we can agree on across the industry, service providers, equipment makers, gaming studios. And you know what? Uh, we may not always be able to satisfy at the end of the day, you know, everybody what what's a good gaming experience to them. But I think we are, will be able to to provide at least an underlying way of measuring it uh, to be able to understand that. So I, there's definitely a need there. Right. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll point right. out that there that there there isn't a holistic um, you know kind of quality of experience measurement for for things that have been around for 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 years and years like um, like video on, you know, uh, streaming video, there's not a, you know, a single consistent benchmark across, across there. Um, there's, you know, um, there are some ways to, to measure it. I think, um, I, I think what game bench is, is doing in that, in that space is great. But as, as, as Gino said, you know, the, um, you know, what, well, what matters is really what the, the end customer experience is, um, makes it, the, the differences in networks makes it very hard to, um, uh, to, to really come up with with great measurements from that perspective, but defining what the the customer is experiencing and now maybe that's different uh, based on the the device that they're playing on. Um, certainly, the experiences you know and what they can they can understand and what they can experience is going to be different if they're playing on a on a five G smartphone or on a um, you know seventy five inch uh, uh, TV in their in their living room. But, um, you know, understanding that and looking at it, what's really important is looking at it from a user experience um, perspective, not just, you know, throwing kind of marketing fluff in a, uh, um, in a, uh, uh, in advertisements that, that say, you know, I'm a network for, for gaming, but actually doing something that has a recognizable difference for the, for the customer and viewing it from a customer perspective is absolutely critical. Um, Gunjin, did you have any thoughts on that from the from from the European perspective? I think that uh, you know it. There are a lot of factors um, to have a standardized thing, but you know I think that all the requirements for different games is different. So it depends. It really depends when we're talking about gaming that what type of game you are playing. So you might be very happy with a particular network performance on on a you know game that doesn't have high graphics or it doesn't need such interactive or high speed. Um, reactions but then you know if you're playing another game or if you are in a competitive setup you will have completely different expectations and requirements so it really depends on you know standardization and understanding of what type of games require what type of uh, you know uh, performance so it, it's understanding that and then creating probably some standardization around it uh, i think that's a great answer and i think that was a uh, very sort of in line with what I was going to say next is um, I think one of one of my, our really close uh, friends at another operator said, you know, what's happening now is that operators are, operators are becoming more of marketing companies than technology companies. And it's, it's very sort of important to line up the marketing, which makes sense, which was one of the uh, points in my first few slides, is to be very specific in what's being delivered. So if you are going to be the best at Call of Duty on PC or, or the best, best at Valorant or Wild Rift on mobile, then at least it's important to say exactly what you're good at and what experience you get on a specific game, on a specific device that at least can be met or you can be, you can quantify that versus being very generic about the saying, you know, we are, the, we are the best network of gaming. That probably means nothing because I mean, it's like, it's like, like I have the best of the best of for everything. And that is very, very subjective for the game. Um, and I'm also curious, Johnny, um, you have you, you have a bundle now. I mean, do, do you have a way to quantify this to your, uh, to your audience that's actually buying a gaming bundle to say what is going to be delivered? I think you got, um, it's a difficult one, really, because um, 
you know, like, like Gina said, there's a lot of people have different flavors of pizza, but you know, maybe they don't like pizza. Maybe they like pasta or something. Right. So there's, um, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a lot of different demographics. So when, when we, when we started Zyber, we thought, look, what, you know, what's our core demographic, you know, core demographic was, you know, gamers that, you know, don't, you know, how do you convert a hardcore, um, you know, hardware gamer to cloud? Like it's, it doesn't happen. So, um, you know, what are the secondary demographics that, that go with that? You know, it's families, they have a different set of needs. So um, <clears throat> for us with the bundle, we, ju we just tried to make it as relatable to, you know, as, as many people as possible. So, you know, I would buy it because I can play all the high-end games that have just been released in the cloud. Um, and I can also play, you know, my back catalog of favorites going back, you know, years. So, uh, you know, my kids just want to play Red Bull or, <laughs> or Roblox or, or something completely different on it. And, you know, my, my wife's not into gaming, but, you know, there's a really cool app um, that we found that brings like, you know, like Wii sort of games, but, you know, on the TV and bring it back into the, into the TV world that we can all play as a family and we can use our phones as the remote and, you know, we were bringing the games back into like that living room, like family environment. So I could just imagine us sat around at Christmas all playing this, you know, one game on our TV, like, you, you know, instead of playing like Trivial Pursuit or something. So you've got yeah. to ask, you know, what, you know, what demographic are you trying to hit and why? And, you know, does that relate to, to everybody? And I think that's the, that's the difficulty with bundling because you, 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 you've, you've got to try and pick something that, that caters for everybody. You know, if we were just trying to reach one certain type of gamer, it'd be really simple, but it's, uh, Great. it's not quite like that. Yeah. Thanks, Johnny. I think that's, um, I think you actually sort of define gaming's job at the moment. I think you're trying to crack something very difficult. <laughs> We're getting there, but I'm, I'm pretty comfortable doing it in a few months. Uh, I think we are the hour, but I'd really like to thank the audience. And one thing I would really want to take away, and thanks for sharing that uh, survey with us, Gino. Uh, one thing which is very clear is the, the trend is clearly in the upward direction. Uh, I mean, from the first call I've had with uh, Matt, you on the call to what, what we're talking about now clearly sees, clearly shows that there's an evolution in, in the last six months in terms of how, you know, the audiences are reacting to gaming packages and, and, and the awareness of gaming and operators and ISPs is becoming more and more sort of prominent. More importantly, they are willing to pay. So I'm sure Gino, you said $20 a month, $10 a month. I think gamers have the money to pay if there is a promise that uh, us as an ecosystem can deliver on. So I think that is very, very promising. Bundling, I think seems like a fantastic opportunity. So it's, you know, you can take what you need from the bundle, gaming, streaming, all of that comes together. Uh, when 5G becomes real everywhere, fiber becomes real everywhere. So I think that is again, an important trend that we can actually take notice of. Uh, but overall, uh, the, the exciting part is that there is this uptick we see in adoption and not just in terms of gamers becoming more and more well, they've always been demanding, but they're actually sort of reacting to the uh, the campaigns that operators are putting out. But also the technology is able to support um, on a consistently um, sort of uh, reliable fashion where, you know, low latency doxes or, you know, uh, standalone 5G, all this is coming to support that, that sort of promise that has been put in front of gamers. So I'm super excited about the next few months to see how the adoption is going to increase. Uh, but I think it's going to be the gamers who are going to be the true winners. Uh, they're going to be even more demanding. You know that already. Uh, no data caps, uh, probably getting everything for free is what's going to be the next thing, but we'll have to wait and see how that evolves. So thank you everyone for um, joining this panel. Um, and uh, for, for sharing your thoughts. But again, this is one of many webinars we're going to do. So thank you again, and thank you for attending, um, and have a great weekend ahead. Thank, thank you, everyone. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All the best.